the reading and the things God has shown you, but it's not going to happen because we'll be here all, all day. So, but Matthew, if you would with me, go to Matthew. Oh, I'm so excited. It's like I've got tears in my eyes, man. Matthew chapter one. Really wonderful, wonderful. What a wonderful father we have. Amen. And the more, the more you and I get this truth in us. Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Amen. Liberate you inside. Cause you to see. See, God wants you to see. That's why he gave us those spirit anointed prayers. That the eyes, right? Your, your, your inward vision be illuminated. So when you read the word, you're not just reading this as a book. Like, you know, some bestseller, but uh, although it's a bestseller yeah. uh, in eternity uh, and in there, you're seeing what God sees. He's revealing and unveiling you. I'm telling you. And then and in this hour, it's of the utmost importance. It's vital to you to take your medicine. This is your medicine. This is the remedy. Come on. God's word is spirit. It's life. Jesus said the words I speak are spirit. They're life. So every time you just pop one of these words, it's like taking a, uh, an antioxidant in the spirit realm. You're taking God's medicine, God's word. You're filling up and causing your spirit, man, to be strengthened and nourished in words of faith. I'm telling you, spend some time and invest. Study to show yourself approved. There'll be all kinds of things vying for your time, your attention, your affection. But give it to him and you'll never, ever be dissatisfied. Amen? That's why I said taste and see. You taste the word and then once you ingest it, you begin to see different. Just like people ingest certain things. This guy was telling me the other day about how they take THC out of marijuana and they put it in butter. And then they butter some toast with that marijuana butter. And it affects them. And that's what people do. That You know, these hallucin hallucinogenics cause people to see things, doesn't it? They ingest something, whether it's alcohol or drugs or something. Or something, they begin to see differently, so to speak. Man, when you receive the word of God, you be, and you receive the the revelations that the Holy Spirit unlocks and reveals you begin to see different. You see life different. You see things differently. Amen. And, and, the, and you know, it's like they said to Paul, you know, Agrippa said, saying, Paul, well, I'm going to read it to you real quick just because I saw it the other day. Before, just hang out there in Matthew. I'm just going to read this to you. So you can see it. He says, and as he spake himself, uh, it, it was Acts 26. You can go there to one, verse 24. And he said, uh, with a loud voice, Paul, you are, you are beside yourself. You are mad. Much learning has made you crazy. And he said, oh, I am not crazy. I am not mad. I am not insane. But I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> the words of truth. Amen. Thank you for this word. Amen. So, Matthew, let's, let's, I'm just going to spend some time reading some of these things. And uh, you can follow along with me. In verse 18. Hey, Rich, can you go around this way and give me that water? Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. Thank you. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought on these things, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. 
and she'll bring forth the son, and you're going to call his name Jesus. See, he's going to save his people from their sins. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, took unto him his wife, and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called her, and, and he called his name Jesus. Now, um, why don't we all read together this next chapter going into chapter two? Let's read it together from the King James Version. If you don't have a King James Version, just go ahead and listen, all right? So we're not having a redundancy. All right, ready? Let's read it. Now, chapter two. Chapter two, if you have a King James Bible, we can read together. If not, just stay silent. Ready? Let's read. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, uh, on, keep reading. Everybody read, read. Of Judea. All right. Okay. I can see we have too many translations going on here. All right. Okay. I'll just read it then. <laughs> Amen. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the king? Where, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and come to worship. Herod the king had heard these things, and he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, uh, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said in, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it was written by the prophet. Okay. Okay. Uh, thus was written by the uh, uh, by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judea, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee will come a governor and a rule my people. Now I want to say this: you look, the angels refer to the word. Amen. Please notice that as you read. These wise men from the east follow the. You know, nature, they were directed, yes. right? Okay, they were directed by an angel. Then when the priests and prophets were asked the question, they knew the word. They knew where to go. Okay, it says uh, the scribe, excuse me, and the priest. So verse seven, and Herod, when he had privately called the wise man, inquired of them diligently where the star appeared. And he, and he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go search diligently, for the young, and when you find them, come give me word again, and uh, worship, so I can worship with them. When they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till they came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy, and were glad. And when they were come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, the mother, they fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and mirror. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country uh, another way. Okay? Now, I, wanna, I just want to share this. These are wise men from the east. You understand? These are not um, necessarily Jews. They're just wise men. There were people from the east. Where's the east? east? The east is Asia, places of such. And they weren't led by the word. They saw the star. But they heard the voice of God. And so they probably had somewhere come in contact with some truth or revelation because they knew that that star represented something do you understand so that's in the scriptures that's in the scripture somewhere okay so i, I don't that's why he's called them the, the the bright and morning star so the reality is they have known that so they come out of these places in the east all the way to jerusalem and follow that 
And they knew that that was God and worshiped him as king, as Lord and Savior. Amen? So um, let's keep reading. And when they were departed, and, and notice they had a, a, a place with the king. Notice these wise men. So these were not just people rolling out of the, you know, homeless people just saying, hey, I saw a star. These were people, well, I'm just saying, these were people that had, you know, uh, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? They had, I don't want to say, they had uh, clout. They had uh, nobility. They had, uh, you know, some form of honor or reputation that they could approach the king. You understand? So these weren't ignorant, ignorant people right here. Yeah. These, these were people, men of stature, men of honor, noblemen. These were not, you know, just some buffoons that were uneducated and ignorant, and, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, you know, corrupt people. These were people that had, you know, some level in society. Okay. So, um, and then, uh, so they went and it says they brought gifts. Look at gold, frankincense, and mirror. Now, then they were warned to God. So apparently they knew the same God that Joseph knew. Amen. So there's an answer to how God works in other nations with people that weren't Jews. Okay. God is able to direct people to the Lord Jesus. Okay. Now, let me just get to where we're going. And when they were departed, verse 13, behold, an angel appeared unto Joseph in a dream saying, arise. Take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and be thou until I bring word. For Herod will seek the young child and destroy him. Uh, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. So the amazing thing, I want you to see all the places Jesus lived. Watch. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked, he was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in the coast, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was there fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah, was a voice heard of lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, the angel appeared again in a dream to Joseph, saying, Arise now, uh, take the young child and the mother, and go into the land of Israel. For they that are dead which sought child's life, he arose, took the child and the mother, went to the land of Israel. <laughs> And when he heard that, whatever the guy's name, Archelaus, did reign in Judea in the room of his father, he was afraid to go there. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, the interesting thing just to point out here, we're going to share some more on Friday, uh, but let's just point some of the stuff out real quickly. Jesus was in Egypt, wasn't he? Egypt, yeah. Yeah. an ungodly land, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, he also tells us that um, Jesus came out of Bethlehem, right, as the scriptures uh, teach. Then he, he went into uh, Galilee. And uh, then he was called a, Na a, a Nazarene, right? And so you can see all these places are symbolic. I'm not going to go into all that in, in the Old Testament, but there's symbolisms here. Now, I want you to just print, bring out a couple points, though, because a lot of times when it comes to Christmas, people miss the Christmas story. Yeah. They do, man. They, they, they get wrapped up in this right here, which is a manger. Lots of Christians get sidetracked from the main focus of Christmas, okay? And even the world, they're going to celebrate Christmas, but they won't celebrate the 
foundation or the truth about what Christmas is all about. Amen. Amen. And how can you celebrate something that you, I don't celebrate Ramadan. I don't. I don't celebrate Hanukkah. I celebrate Christmas. So there's a lot of people that celebrate things, but their heart doesn't register with the truth about what that uh, special day is all about. Now, I want to just, all I'm going to do is just read some things to you and show you how many times they don't really understand even their own father. And, and because of their adolescence and immaturity, they are negligent when it comes to knowledge. Um, so let me just bring this to your attention. And you'll see in here, like a lot of people, and nothing wrong, but there's a lot of angelic activity going on here, isn't there? Right? Angels speaking in dreams. So you have a lot of Christians, and I'm just saying this, and I'm not being mean. Uh, I'm just saying, look, they want God to speak to them in a dream. They want an angel to visit. They're more uh, interested in angels and dreams and God speaking to them through these avenues. You get it? Look, man, if God brings it, nothing wrong with an angel. An angel appeared to Paul on a boat, right? He said, there stood by me this night and angel. But guess what? Also in Colossians, it tells you people are into angel worship. A lot of Christians, they're all about, nothing wrong. We do have angels. We, we need to use our angels. But my point is, is people are looking for messages from angels. They're looking for dreams and all these things. Look, you have the written word and you're led by your spirit. You're not led by an angel. You're not led by a dream. Although God can speak through a dream, can't he? He can speak through an angel. But God's prim primary, <laughs> primary way, which he communicates to his sons and daughters, is through the agency of the word and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So you understand that. And these people weren't born again back then. So God had to communicate. He couldn't communicate to them uh, on the inside. He couldn't communicate through their conscience. Do you understand? They couldn't, they couldn't know the voice of their shepherd, right? They couldn't hear the voice, know the voice, understand him. They weren't led by God. So they had to be communicated to outwardly, right? You and I as New Testament believers, he tells us you and I are to cultivate an inward life and be led and directed and guided by his Holy Spirit. Amen. So, and also here's, here's another aspect. When we read all this, there's some wonderful things, and we're going to go over to Luke 2 and just touch on this. There's some wonderful things that uh, Luke 1 and Luke 2 that we're going to talk about. Um, let's talk about this real quick, just in this introduction. We can talk about wise men, right? Yeah. And here's what I'm saying. Lots of people build messages around wise men, don't they? around Christmas time. We could talk about, you know, the scenario that Joseph was, look, Joseph was a just man. Joseph was an honorable man. His woman that he was engaged to or espoused to was found to be with child. How would you feel? And so my point is, he was an honorable man. So we could talk about how honorable Joseph was, what a great servant he was. We can talk about all that. We can talk about how angels appeared. Um, but we can talk about dreams. Um, we can talk about, you know, the, the, the supernatural birth of Jesus, right? When he said, the angel said, this thing which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. We can talk about... Uh, you know, the the verses that were a virgin will be with child and bring forth son. They'll call his name God with us. God with us. We can talk about that encounter where where uh, Ephesians, I mean, Philippians 2 tells us that he uh, stripped himself and came in the form of man. In the form of a servant. We can talk about all these interactions that went on 
the, the star, the, the priest knowing the scriptures, all these things. But, you know, none of these things are the, are the point is what I'm saying. They're all just sideshows. It's all they are. It's all they are. Amen. Are you catching my drift? Just listen. There's a lot in here and in Luke 2 that over the years I've heard people teach and give Christmas messages on. But none of them are the pinnacle of what the Christmas story is all about. And I'm telling you, the Christmas story is all about what we read. In Romans 5. Right? In Romans 5, I'm gonna just, you don't have to turn it, just hold. Here's what the Christmas story is about. The Christmas story is about for God's free gift is not all to be compared to the trespass. His grace is out of proportion to the fall of man. For if, if many died through one man's falling away, his lapse is up much more profusely. The grace of God, the free gift, the undeserved favor has abounded unto many by Jesus Christ shall overflow for the benefit of many. The Christmas story is simply about the redemption of humanity and nothing more. That's it. That is it, friend. The highest point of the Christmas story is understanding that Jesus was born to die. That is it. In a nutshell, there's all kinds of sideshows and different things that went on. But if you don't catch the revelation of Jesus' birth was all about coming to shed his blood, to pay the price for man's sin and, and, and bring man back into a place of one with the father through his blood. You miss the Christmas story. It's a beautiful story about a baby. And you can say, well, he had to sleep in a manger because the world didn't want him. And he was rejected and all that baloney. That's all a bunch of just, it's just things that happen. It doesn't mean the world's a bad place. Jesus came into a hostile environment when he came to earth. Do you understand? He came into a place full of sin, inequity, and death, disease, brokenness, weakness. You could talk about the healings of Jesus. That wasn't his purpose. First John tells you, for this purpose, the Son of Man, Son of God, was manifested to destroy, dissolve, melt down the works of the devil. What was the work of the devil? What did the devil work in humanity? Death. <laughs> Amen. Are you guys here this morning? <clears throat> so, I mean, a lot of people around Christmas getting happy about a tree and some candy canes and presents. They're going to get happy about, they're going to tell the Christmas story about the wise men. They're going to point out certain aspects about the Christmas story. And they're all just side, they're just things that happen. They're different events. There's some spiritual co connotation and connection to it, but they are not the pinnacle. The home run is hit when you have a revelation of why Jesus came to this earth. And if you don't speak and preach that, then you are, you are not communicating the gospel. Because the gospel and the Christmas story is all about Jesus coming for one purpose only. That's it. Amen. There's dreams. There's angels. There's a supernatural birth. There's an immaculate conception. There's, you know, all these warnings. There's children dying. There's all kinds of things that you can talk about, but none of those, none of those have any major effect and impact upon a person's life until they receive the truth of redemption. That's what Christmas is all about. It's not about a baby lying in a manger with some hay and some animals and people bringing frankincense, gold, and beer and worshiping him. That's just all part of the big picture. But the main thread is the thread of redemption. And when you get that, you will get excited about Christmas. Now, let's just look. Let's go over to Luke 2. Luke 1 and 2. Come on now. Everything led and culminates right here, friend. Right here. 
Look at this. Right here, everything finishes at the Lord's Supper for you and I. Everything that he did, past, present, and the future will find its fulfillment right here at the communion table. Amen? As often as you do this and drink this. See, when you eat this bread, this little wafer, your faith is calling to remembrance, summons into affection. Come on now. Summonsing that amazing life that he came and gave in this earth. But it wasn't just some sweet little baby in the world rejected him and they put him. There was no room for him at the end. Great little Christmas story. And how is that going to be applied in your life? <coughs> How? All that teaches you the world's ugly, an earthly place, there's no room for Jesus. There will be persecutions. Who cares about all that? Our focus is on Jesus. My God, he had tabernacled himself in a human body. His great love, he stepped out of eternity for you and I. I'm not worried about a baby. I'm more enthralled with the plan of God. Yes. A glorious plan. Amazing. Which you and I should be rejoicing in. These people didn't have the revelation you and I had. They're, they're coming with frankincense gold and, and they realize this is some great God and you know all this and you know they, but they didn't have the truths that you and I hold today. And the understandings. So you and I, when you celebrate Christmas, you mean, don't be thinking about Jesus in a manger. Thinking about, thank you that you did come. I mean, he had to come through the portal hole of the way you and I came into the earth. He came through your mom's womb. That's right. For by one man, sin came by man, by flesh, by, by, by the body, by the temple. God had to come through the earth the same road to redeem man in the same way. He had to take not himself the nature of angels, but all of the seed of Abraham. That's the Christmas story. That's it. So when you celebrate Christmas, all you can see at Christmas is, thank God you saved me, delivered me, preserved me from the curse, from sin, the consequences of sin, the devil from every iniquity and darkness and lewdness and filth and grime that's in the earth today. I'm bought free. None of it can stick in my life. I've been regenerated. I'm regenerated. I'm a new man in Christ because that baby came. And if you can't tie that together, then Christmas story don't mean nothing but a bunch of Christmas lights, trees, candy canes, presents, and a fine roast that your grandma made at Christmas. That's all it means. If you can't tie the connection between that story, what it's all about. It's the fact that when you leave church today, you should recognize I'm a new creature in Christ. I got a new nature. I'm the righteousness of God right now. I stand in a place without a sense of guilt, condemnation, and shame as though sin never existed. I have access to my Father. I can go boldly to the throne of grace, receive mercy, find grace to help in time of need. I don't have to whine. I don't have to murmur. I don't have to complain. I can walk in the spirit of faith. Come on. I can run out against every giant, every sin, every failure, every weakness, every lack, every disease, every problem that ever approaches my life. I have unlimited authority. It's not just a good church message. It's something that you and I go out of this place and understand. All authority has been given back to me because of what Jesus did. Lord at thy birth. Lord at thy death. People tell all kind of great stories, but look, if you ain't reigning after hearing that Christmas story, then you didn't get the gospel. Because the gospel is the news that lifts you back up and says what the devil did in Adam limited you, uh, uh, occupied you, dominated you, restricted you, controlled you. 
But the gospel, the message of the Christmas story elevates you to say that God's for you who can be against you now. But you can't teeter-totter and drink the cup of demons and the cup of God. That's what Paul said. You got to keep drinking the cup of the Lord. Yeah. You can't drink in both worlds, friend. Don't want to. You got to drink the cup of the Lord. If you want the power to be online, oh yeah, you can make heaven, but you won't reign on the earth. Mm -mm. No, you won't. You won't reign over that guilt. You won't reign over that shame. You won't reign over that condemnation. Condemnation's already in the earth because of Adam. What did Jesus say in John chapter Chapter 3, look what Jesus said. God sent his son not to reject or condemn or pass sentence on the world, but that the world might receive salvation and be made safe. John 3, 17, 18. He who believes in him is not judged. He, he who trusts in him never comes up for judgment. For him, there is no rejection, condemnation, damnation. But he who does not believe is judged already. He's already been convicted and already received his sentence because he has not believed, trusted in the name of the only begotten son. He is condemned for refusing to rest his trust in the name of Jesus. The basis of this judgment is here. This is the basis of the judgment. It is the test by which men are judged. The ground for the sentence is this. Light came into the world. Come on now. Christmas is a time of great light. The revelation light. Not, not, that's what light is. Light is truth. It brings God's perspective and the reality of who he is and his dominion back into earth. Light has come. That's the basis. Men stand, con men are already condemned. Condemnation already settled in, for by one man condemnation came. Not as Adam did, much more. Come on now. Much, much more. Much more. But you got to get a revelation of it. Otherwise, you'll just see Christmas as a baby in a manger and a few angels and some dreams. And hallelujah, I love you, Jesus. Until Christmas season's over. And then it's back to the putridness of the world. You, while you're going to church still. That is not the pinnacle of the Christian experience. You go from glory to glory. You begin to value Christmas more and more. You have Christmas every day. Glory to God. Because Jesus said, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. Come on, but a body. That's what Jesus said before he ever came into the earth in the form of little, you know, little baby boy. In eternity, he said, look, man, we don't need all the goats and the rams and the bulls and the blood and the, the smell. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, Father, but a body hast thou prepared for me. You had no pleasure. Then I say, lo, I come to do your will, O God. Come on now, you got, if that ain't matched in the Christmas story, that great step out of eternity to die, to come, God commended his love, his love. So when you, the, the, the landing place is right here, is that God came because he loved, he wanted to buy you back, set you free, take you out of the control and dominion of darkness. So you ain't, you ain't dominated, ruled and pimped by sin and the devil. You're not dominated by your emotions and your feelings and your body. Other people's opinions of you. You're not controlled by unforgiveness and offenses. Jealousies, hate, and envy. Why? Because all things are yours. He gave you all things that pertain to godliness in life now. Right now. It's all yours now. Christ redeems you from the curse. You're blessed with, with every spiritual blessing in him. That's right. Everything is yours now. He gave you the Holy Ghost to lead you as his workmanship created Christ. He's taking the paths, the good life. 
so that your days are full of peace, joy, the kingdom of God, righteous peace and joy of the Holy Ghost. You're not threatened by COVID. You're not worried about a, a, a Biden or a Trump or a this or that. You're not concerned with a, the, the fear of the earth that's gripped them. You're the antidote. You're a living epistle. You're a sweet smelling fragrance. Amen. An aroma. Amen. But I'll tell you, if you ain't been dwelling with him, the wharf coming off you may not be what Christmas story says you should be. That's the truth. Because this is where we land. Thanking God that Amen. that baby that I'm crucified. See, the day Jesus came in, he was already crucified. He was crucified before he ever left heaven. Yeah. Yeah. In the mind of God. The minute Jesus said, Lo, I come to do your will. That moment, Jesus vowed and bought in, but he had to walk it out in the earth. So the Christmas story is about redemption. It's a bloody story. Look at Luke 2. All right, I'm going to finish up right here. Luke 2. Luke 2. I'll show you. Look at Luke Luke. Luke 1, 2. See, it takes time before we understand. There's a lot of good stuff in this story. Look at, let's even look at, uh, uh, hold on a second. Let me just see. Look at, uh, let's look at verse 67. Luke 2, uh, 167. And, and look. Don't get caught up in the players. People are just vessels. A lot of these people were just vessels. They were God's children. God loved them. God just used them because they were willing. They were obedient. They were given to him. They were holy, honorable vessels. But they were just parts in the big picture. Pieces used by God. Verse 67, and his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Now, in Zechariah's mind, are you ready? You know what Zechariah is thinking about? Just Israel. That's all Jared, That's all Zechariah thought about was Israel. Just like America just thinks about America. Other nations think about just themselves. They're all, they're all fools. They have limited thinking because of sin and no revelation. John the Baptist had revelation. John said, look, there's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. There. Right there is God's sacrifice. There is the atonement for humanity. Jesus is not just an American God. He is God's sacrificial lamb. This in the manger is the lamb. Glory to God. Don't just look at Jesus when he's 33, friend. Look from his birth. From before. He said right here. He visited us. And saved his people. He raised up a horn of salvation. In the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets. Which have been since the world began. The first prophet was Adam. He said. That we should be saved for our enemies and from the land of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant us that we be delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Come on. You might serve him without fear. Amen. You might serve him in faith. You're not afraid of God. In holiness, righteousness, all your days. Look real quick. Hebrew, I mean, Ephesians 3. We're finishing. 
When you look at the Christmas story, man, don't get caught up in all the sideshows, man. Get caught up in the reality of what Christmas means. And share that message. There's all kind of wonderful things in the word of God. But the main theme is that Jesus came to redeem, to buy back, to purchase man, to give his life, to shed his blood. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. You belong to God, little children. You are not of yourselves. Greater is he who's in you than he's in his world. What you worried about the world for? You worried about fears and pandemics and wars, wars and rumors. Who cares? Look up, your redemption's coming. Get your eyes off man. Get your eyes off the government. Get your eyes off COVID. Get your eyes, walk and live serving him in righteousness, holiness, without fear of God, reigning in this life, overcoming by the blood and your testimony. That you don't care if they come slice and dice your head off. That number one, you have given yourself to him wholly, and nothing can stop you if God's for you. The Lord is your helper, but you better get that and be fully persuaded and not just going to church. Because church won't save you. But a revelation and the reality is what Peter said in Acts chapter 2. Save yourself from this untold generation. How do you save yourself? Call on the name of the Lord. That's how you save yourself. Your cooperation and faith will bring a manifestation and demonstration of his power. Make no mistake about it. Watching by YouTube or in this room. This is what you need right here in this critical hour to lift you out of the unbelief, the doubt, the fear, the confusion that's in the earth today. Get your heart set on this Blood, what it's done. As it said, Romans 3, 25, that by faith, such as by faith, that a man can unite himself with the divine victim. And in that union, glory to God, enter in to a blessed state of one man with the Father. Then you can walk out like the Apostle Paul. They stone you, you'll fall down and get back up. There must be a revelation. There must be. This truth governing, controlling, and influencing you. It must get past our, our reasoning and our intellect and dwell richly in our heart so that we govern our life by it and we do not adhere to anything contrary to God's word Amen. or what he did for us. Amen. The devil is already defeated. Amen. Ephesians 3, he has no right with sickness, with lack, with discouragement, with fear, we're trying to minimize, uh, marginalize and minimize you. He has the only place the enemy has is the place you gave him. That's it. He can't take any opportunity or place in your life unless you allow it. Shut the door. Resist the devil, the scripture says, and he will flee from you. All because of the Christmas story. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But you got to keep that truth dwelling richly in you. Yes. Look at look at Ephesians 3, and then we're, we'll, we'll be finishing up. Ephesians 3. I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, if you heard of the dis dispensation of grace, which was given to me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. I'm telling you what the mystery is. Of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed by the holy apostle by the Spirit, that Gentiles be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of promise in Christ by the gospel, partakers. That means what's in Jesus has now come to live on the inside of you. Hello, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Come on, that same love, that same life, that same righteousness. So never minimize any of that by allowing unbelief, fear, or the world, or a COVID, or a, or a this, or a that to minimize and strip down the revelation, pull Jesus down from the cross. No, sir, read. 
You can't go to church and not come away with this truth. If you did, went to church and you don't have this revelation, you're in the wrong church. You are in the wrong church. You'll be looking to everything else, to the government, to medicine, to science, to your family. You'll look to everybody else in the world, but the person you're supposed to be understanding and looking to. Looking unto Jesus, author and finisher of your faith. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. What about work? What about retirement? What about my job? What about food? Take no thought saying what I'll eat, what I'll wear, where will I be? Take no thought saying. But take thought saying, the Lord is my provider. The Lord is my shelter. The Lord is my healer. The Lord is my keeper. The Lord is my protector. The Lord is my strengthener. The Lord is a very present help. Come on, you'll have to fight the fight of faith. See, what, what, what Jesus acquired for you must be apprehended by faith. And once you apprehend it by faith, then you'll have to protect it by faith to guard and keep these truths. He said, wherefore, I was made a minister according to the grace of God by the effectual work of his power. When at least then all the saints is this given that I preach the unsearchable. You hear that? Unsearchable. You can't search for it. As was quoted by William Barclay, the gospel is not something man attains to by his intellect. Rather, it is a revelation. It's not something you discover. It's something revealed to you. But once he reveals it to you, he reveals it to you because he loves you and he wants you to take that truth and appropriate it in your life so you can live victorious and more than a conqueror lifestyle. I'm not just talking about living in a mansion, driving a Cadillac. I'm talking about you reigning over sin. I'm talking about you reigning over your fears and your and, and the fraudulent identity that the world tries to serve you up and dress you up in. That fake costume the world tries to, to enslave you with. He says, and to make all men see, you ready? Make all men see what is the mystery from the beginning of the world. Uh-oh. Hello, the beginning of the world which has been hidden God who created all things by Christ. Now, you ready? Ready? Here it is. We're closing with this. And, and No, we have to look at Hebrew. No, I won't even go to Hebrews. We'll finish it for Friday. He says right here, now, look at God. He wants to smear it in the face of the devil. Come on. He wants the devil and the yes. world and heaven under heaven and earth, everything. That's why when you read Revelations, they are casting their crowns. They are saying to him the honor, glory, dominion, and power forevermore. Are you listening to me this morning? To him alone be honor, power, dominion, and glory. Don't you ever think that some disease, some stupid pandemic, some other garbage has a greater hold on you than his lordship. To him alone belongs glory, honor, power, and dominion. Don't you let fear of lack, fear of sickness, fear of uh, rejection, fear of abandonment, fear of what people did, fear of what the future holds. Don't let any of that have any place in your mind. That's why Jesus said, I will worship the Lord God and him only will I serve. Whatever you focus and give your attention to is what you're serving, friend. Where, you're, where your heart is is where your treasure is. If your attention and affection are on your problems, on your anxieties, on your worries, on your fears, on your have-nots, then that's what you are serving. You cannot serve God in mammon. See, everything in the earth is tied to mammon. Everything is tied to mammon. Everything. You will either hold the one and just everything's tied to mammon. Everything. Study. You have to get revelation on that. So he says right here, let's stand up. He says, Ephesians, glory to God. He says, verse 10. I'm going to read the Empire. This is the purpose. The purpose is that through the church now, 
the complicated, many-sided wisdom of God. Oh, Lord. Woo! <laughs> Don't you, friend, in this church this morning and watching don't you ever confuse and think that you're struggled, you're bound, there's no way out, the situation's hopeless. Yeah. Don't, don't okay. I beg you, don't you for one minute ever think so silly and ignorant like that. Yeah. Don't you ever minimize God in that way. Yeah. <laughs> because I just read to you, God has many Many solutions, many ways out. And all you have to do is read the word. You see many men say, they don't know what to do. Paul the apostle, you know what God told him? You know what God told Elijah? Come on now, now listen, don't check out. I'm here for you, not for myself. He said to Elijah, I preserve me a remnant. He told the same thing to Paul. I got many men in this city. Make no mistake about it. No matter how many compromise, how many go away, how, how ugly, how dark it looks, remember this, that God has many. Do you understand? Not only that, but an innumerable company of angels ready to be dispatched. That's why Jesus told Pilate, don't you think for a moment, Mr. Pilate, that I cannot dispatch legions right now with one echo of my voice. Right now, come out of eternity, legions of the host of the living God. Don't you ever misunderstand him. And if you think and you're watching, that preacher's crazy and he's insane. No, it's called understanding. There's a creator, the living God. Who sits on a throne, who people, angels bow down because they see the awesomeness, the majesty, the glory and power of this living God. And at some point, you will slip out of that earthly stoop and stand before this majestic king. So don't you ever confuse somebody preaching a word out of the realm that you cannot see. Amen. Amen. Make no mistake. Because Jesus said, don't you think I can't now summon 10,000 legions at my dispatch and annihilate this earth. So don't you think for one moment some putrid disgusting work called COVID-19 has anything against the power of a resurrected Savior. Amen. Don't you doubt for one minute. Don't ever think that God's power cannot annihilate, decimate whatever little putrid attack the devil has launched against you. Hiroshima has nothing if God speaks in this earth. If he wants to annihilate this earth, he said, fear him not that destroys the body. But you reverence him that has all dominion to cast into eternal damnation. Do you ever reverence anything higher than him? If you do, you have compromised real faith. And you are not persuaded like the forefathers who were eaten alive by life. And they never bowed out. They never bowed out of the fire. They never bowed out when they were sawed asunder. Men fought valiantly. That's in Hebrews 11 if you don't know the word. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. This Amen. Works Amen. when you work it. Amen. 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 Well, we appreciate you joining in. Power, power. Sometimes the Holy Ghost just wants to power. take over. It's his show. <laughs> We're just vessels of honor. Amen. 
But our God is great and mighty in this hour. Make no mistake, friend. Fear not. Isaiah 41 says, fear not, for I am with you. Don't you be dismayed. Don't you be deceived. I will strengthen you, help you, and uphold you in the right hand of my righteous dominion. Our God is a great God and a consuming fire. Amen. If you're watching or you're going to see this video, please take communion. Literally, your life depends on it. So does ours. Father, we thank you for what this represents. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity. You abolished in your flesh the enmity, even the laws and commandments contained in ordinances to making himself of one new man, soul making peace, completeness, Lord. Thank you. You received us back. We receive our healing today, our strength today. We thank you so much, Father. We've trusted you in our lives. We vowed ourselves and sworn ourselves to you. We thank you for your precious blood in this hour. It is the antidote for humanity. Amen. When we put faith in it. I speak a blessing right now over people watching, people that will hear, people that will heed. As you said, Lord, you annulled and annihilated the old covenant. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats, but by your own blood. You entered in once. One time it was so good, it affected all eternity, past, present, and future. For by one offering, you have now perfected us. We thank you so much, Lord, being justified freely by your grace through the redemption that's in Jesus. You set Jesus forth, Lord. No matter where we're at today, if we don't know him or we've struggled with sin or adversity, the blood of Jesus sets us free. It emancipates us, it frees us. And helps us to continue walking in the light of redemption. That we would know you more and more. Looking for that great God and Savior as the day approaches. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We honor you. Thank you for your spirit that protects and preserves us. We trust you, Lord. We depend upon you. We thank you for the power of your blood over our lives. Like a canopy, Lord insulating and protecting us, cleansing and purifying, purging our heart and conscience from dead works, setting us our place to serve the living God. There's not anything in our lives that the blood doesn't radically cleanse and purge and purify. The blood of Jesus has given us access, Lord, that we can now approach you, Father, without anything standing in our way. We honor you this morning. We release your favor, your blessing. We're holy without blame before you in love, Lord. Oh, the love of God. We drink that. We partake of it. Your love is better than wine. Surely the goodness and mercy follow us all our days. We lay aside every weight, sin, anything that would hinder us. Lord, we want to know you even more. We speak your blessing over every person in here. We break your power and your assignment, Father. Over every person here, just receive, raise up your hand right now. You're fighting a symptom, anything. In the name of Jesus, be devastated, annihilate, you spirit of infirmity. You leave bodies, you leave minds, you spirit of oppression and fear, discouragement. We declare liberty, fresh vision, scales removed, eyes open, understanding enlightened and illuminated, flood and fill this place, Father. So we worship you. We thank you, Father. Thank you for your great love. Come on. The presence of God is in this place. It never fails. Just receive of that love. Receive of his goodness. Come on. Lay aside every weight and sin. Come on. Put down the things that you know in your life are hindrances. Come on. They're nothing. They're not even worth hanging on to. Come on. Just like Paul was on that ship and they had to throw everything to lighten the load. Just lighten your load now so that you're just a vessel. Just a vessel geared, governed by the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father. We love you. Thank you for this life. We commune with you. We want to drink of the cup of the Lord. We might know you and be more intimately acquainted, understanding how wonderful it is to be in you, the wonders of your person. And then, Lord, comprehending what, what you gave the Apostle Paul by the Holy Ghost, Lord. That we died with Christ and raised to a new life. Thank you. 
name of Jesus. Well, if you're watching and you see this video, we're in San Francisco. We want to encourage you to come by or reach out to us. Also, if we've sown into you spiritual things, we want to ask you, really, uh, we have a need. And so we've never done this, but we're going to start asking people, if you watch this, send an offering. I guarantee this is good ground. And as you sow, you will see supernatural, miraculous blessings, favor of God open up in your life. And as you give to this ministry, we declare it. We promise that God's word is yes to you. As you sow, you will reap. So we bless you. Amen. We declare God's goodness Amen. and blood sanctify you. Amen. And cleanse you, preserve your life today. In Jesus' name. Thank you for joining with us. Look forward to you uh, participating in that and sharing this time with us. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.